Thank you very much for the introduction and also thank you very much to you and the other organizers for having me here and more generally for setting up this meeting. The first installment of this meeting at the ERGS will always have a special place in my heart because it was, was the first time I met other topos theorists and this meeting was so far uh, exactly as lovely as the first one. In this talk we will first use the magic of topos theory in order to fix the image quality much better. And uh, then we'll have a quick discussion of the proper background of the internal language of topuses, see how it applies to commutative algebra, and finally have a very, very embarrassing slide. You have been warned. I hope you will enjoy the talk, and if you have questions, just ask them during the talk. Don't spare them till the end. We'll start with, a, with three motivating test cases from commutative algebra. A baby example, a child example, and an example which is named after Grotendieck. The baby application is the following. Let M be a matrix over a commutative ring and assume that the induced linear map is surjective. Further, assume that the matrix has more rows than columns. Then the claim is that 1 equals 0. So if A was a field, then this wouldn't be a surprise at all because you learned this on your first day in university. Yeah, it's a basic statement from linear algebra. But this is for general rings. I'm assuming reducedness um, here, but, but this could also be removed. Okay, and on the right, we have the child application, which is just the dual statement. If we have an injective matrix with more columns than rows, then the only way this can happen is that the ring is the zero ring. So how do we prove that? If you open a random book, textbook on commutative algebra, you will see the following proofs. And I'll just quickly take you through them. So the first example. Assume not. Okay. So then the ring is not the zero ring. And for such kinds of rings, you know that there is a maximal ideal M. You use the axiom of choice in order to prove that. Um, then you pass to the quotient ring, A mod M. This is a field. And passing to the quotient preserves subjectivity because it's right exact. Therefore, we have now reduced to the situation that we have a subjective matrix over field. This can't happen by day one of university. Therefore, we have a contradiction. The proof of the second example is a little bit more complicated. It starts the same, we assume not. And then we have a look at a minimal prime ideal. So if we first use some theory to ensure the existence of some prime ideal, that Zorn's lemma certainly suffices, but a weaker statement called the Boolean prime ideal theorem would also. And then we use Zorn's lemma again in order to obtain a minimal prime ideal. We then take the stalk at that prime ideal, and then we, the rest is exactly the same. Taking stalks is exact, therefore the matrix remains injective. And you can use um, the Boolean prime ideal theorem, or the axiom of choice if you're a little bit less careful, to show that this stalk is in fact a field. Therefore you've reduced to the situation of day one of university, and you conclude. We can't simply take the same proof idea as on the left for the statement on the right, because passing to the quotient will usually not preserve injectivity. Okay. For reduced stress? Yes, yes, I know. I just made it for pedagogical reasons. It, um, everything what I want to say will also work without reducedness. And uh, sorry, Adam, what was your? Yeah, on the right. Because without reducedness, uh, yes, the proof on the left didn't need it. The proof on the right, like this proof on the right, required is because this dog uh, is only a field if you assume that A is reduced. Yeah? It's just a minor point. It will not affect uh, the true ideas of what I'm saying. Um, just one more comment. If you want this proof um, to hold in slightly more general generality, then you can just make it again with a pr prime ideal. For this, you only need the Boolean prime ideal theorem, which is slightly weaker, but still widely unconstructed than the axiom of choice. And then the rest is similar. Okay. 
no transpose uh, are not yeah uh, if over co get general commutative rings it's more complicated but. okay so let's discuss these proofs a little bit so they are short and they are quite elegant but I also hope that in some sense you are shocked by these proofs you see these statements are totally elementary they are just talking about some elements of a commutative ring arranged in a matrix and we have the assumption of surjectivity. You should not need wildly unconstructive statements in order to prove these. There should be more informative proofs. And in fact, um, it, so I took these from, a, from some random commutative algebra textbook, but in fact uh, I just wasn't lucky when I picked that random textbook. If I would have picked the textbook by Lombardi and Kite, then you would see beautiful constructive proofs of these, and in fact you will see uh, 600 pages of very beautiful constructive proofs. Yeah? So there are constructive proofs of these. You do not need those two statements. Let's have a look at the third test case, which is Grodendieck's generic freeness lemma. It's an important theorem in the setup of the theory of modular spaces in algebraic geometry. It roughly says that um, this, uh, the set of points where the fiber dimensions of a sheaf of a reduced scheme jumps is always a very small set. The complement is always dense. Yeah? But the, here's a formal statement which is more involved, which also works for in the non finally generated case. Okay. The details of the statements are not important right now. I just want to uh, tell you a little bit about the proof. Um, so this is the most general statement of generic freeness theorem which I know. Therefore, in order to have a look at the proof, I will certainly turn to the Stacks project because they always give the most general statements and they are very careful to avoid un unnecessary Noetherian conditions and they are also very categorical minded, so it's always a joy to read in the Stacks project. So here you have the section about generic flatness and they first state the theorem in the case that the ring is Noetherian and, do and a domain, in an integral domain. This was also the case uh, which, is, uh, which was proved by Grotendieck. And here you argue by divisage. Yeah? Uh, then you um, lift to the non Noetherian situation by some standard argument in commutative algebra. Um, then you drop a further hypothesis, do some calculations here. Um, then you have to set up a definition in order to properly express the remaining statements. Then uh, somewhere down here you uh, um, you employ similar ideas as in the proof of neutral normalization, and then you are at the end of the proof. So it's approximately three pages, okay? Just to give you an idea of the hardness. So how does Topos theory help commutative algebra? It turns out that we can use Topos theory to first recast the first two examples. We can use the exactly same proofs which, which, which reduce to the situation of fields, but Topos theory will ensure that the proofs you obtain are perfectly constructive, so they are informative. They actually tell you uh, how you can deduce from the ring elements you are given the equation one equals zero. Secondly, we can give a proof of exactly this form of generic freeness theorem in one paragraph. You don't need three pages of several involved reduction steps. You don't need neutral normalization for it. And you will see it in a couple of minutes. Here's a quick reminder on the internal language of toposes, because that's the technical tool we will need. So for any to, uh, topos E, elementary topos subset, and any formula phi, there's a way of defining what it means for the formula phi to hold in the internal universe of that topos E. And depending on uh, in which topos you interpret this, the, me the external meaning will be different. If I'm new to a certain topos and I want to find out which statements hold in it, then I just perform the kripke joyal translation, which I'll show you on the next slide, in order to find out what the external meaning of internal statements is. And then I just check that external meaning using ordinary mathematical reasoning. This is really just a simple translation machinery, right? and I picture that as uh, follows. Um, for instance, if I'm having a phone conversation with Anna, you need to know Anna is not an ordinary mathematician. She lives instead in the effective topos 
which some people prefer to call effective logos because it's a, uh, not a good topos. So then she on the phone, yeah, will say, will, will go on to on a lengthy mathematical discussion and she might start a discussion with, you know, Ingo, it's a basic fact of life that um, any function from the naturals to the naturals is computable. And at first, when she says that, I'm always slightly freaked out because it's a totally wrong statement. There are many functions from the naturals to the naturals which are not computable. For instance, the function which takes a natural number n to 0 or 1, depending on whether the nth Turing machine in some list of Turing machine terminates. But then I remember to switch on the Kripke Jr. translation engine. And then, like, I listen to that engine, and the engine tells me the following. You know, Ingo, it's a basic fact of life that there's a Turing machine which, given a Turing machine which computes some function, outputs a Turing machine which computes that function. And yes, I can accept that statement without problems. The reason why it's justified to talk um, to view toposes as, as alternate universes is because any topos supports mathematical reasoning. If we, using the kripke jarl semantics, obtained knowledge that phi holds an E, and if we can prove intuitionistically that phi entails some further statement psi, then we may conclude that psi also holds an E. So when we've established some base amount of knowledge about a topos, we can then ditch the cryptic general semantics and just reason internally. The only caveat is that full classical reasoning is only available in like three or four toposes. And all the others only satisfy intuitionistic logic. So we can't use law of the middle, we can't use proof by contradiction, we can't use the axiom of choice. Yeah? Um, depending on your training, you might think that therefore all mathematics breaks down, but not, that's not ex, uh, actually the case. For instance, have a look at the 600 pages of very non-trivial amounts of cognitive algebra developed in a purely constructive setting. Here are the details of how you can actually translate statements in the special case of a sheaf topos over a topological space. I don't want you to memorize these statements. They're not important for the remaining of the talk unless you want to actually verify what I'm saying. I just want to have you a quick look at the general structure. We have here one clause for each kind of logical symbol, which tells us how to translate this specific logical symbol. And um, you will see at some times um, that like when we, st we started on the, whole, on the full space, but then the translation semantics automatically guides us to smaller open subsets. For instance, here with the implication, we are already also considering smaller open subsets. Or with the existential quantifier, we are not saying that there is some section precisely on you, but only locally on you, that there's an open covering of you such that on each element of the cover uh, we have a section. I should add that I'm not using the traditional internal language, but a slight extension due to Mike Schulman in order to have clauses for unbounded quantification. These are necessary if you want the statement, you can, um, the, if you want the following statement to not be a lie. The statement is, in the internal universe of a topos, you can express all of constructive mathematics. Because sometimes in constructive mathematics you need unbounded quantification. For instance, if you are a category theorist and want to express a universal property, saying for all groups amounts to for all things, x, such and for all operations on x, x times x to x, such that the group axioms hold, we have blah, blah, blah. Yeah? Okay. Um, I should mention that Mike Schulman was not the first to um, extend the internal language to unbounded quantification. Firstly, there was prior work by Andrew Pitts in his seminal 1987 paper, Polymorphism is set theoretic constructively. <laughs> yes, I think so. In, in, so. You did make it formal, but in section three, you all, all already had the general idea of how to do it. And then there's a 2014... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a 2014 paper by Avodi, Botts, um, Simpson, and Streicher called Relating First Order Set Theories, Toposes, and Category of Classes. Uh, this was published after Mike's paper, um, but they worked independently. And Mike's paper is, um, is really a, a jewel when you just want to 
get to the point regarding unbounded replication. It's called the stack semantics and comparison of material set theories, and you do not need any knowledge of stacks in algebraic geometry in order to enjoy it. Here is a fun example um, about uh, how we can use the internal language. It doesn't have anything to do with the community of algebra, therefore I thought it would be a good idea so that you can gain something from this talk if you're not interested in community of algebra. Let X be a space, let's say for simplicity a topological space. And let's assume that we are given a continuous family of continuous functions on X. By this I actually mean just a continuous function from the product X times R to R, but I think about them in a different way. Then we have the sheaf C of continuous functions on X, and this family containing lots of continuous functions induces a single morphism from C to C via the rule displayed on the board. And then employing the cryptic real semantics, actually that's a nice exercise if you've never done it, you can check the following statements. Firstly, this sheaf C feels like a set from the internal point of view. This is a general phenomenon of the internal language. Any object of the topos feels like a set from the internal point of view. Any morphism in the topos feels like a map of sets. Any epimorphism feels like a subjective map. Any injective morphism, any monomorphism feels like an injective map, and so on. Um, uh, what, what does it mean feel? Very good question. It means that I can, I can pretend that they are as long as I'm staying in the internal universe of the topos, which practically amounts to that at the end of the day I perform the kripke Girard translation to obtain actual normal external statements. Yeah? And it turns out that C is not some arbitrary set in the topos, but C verifies exactly what you would expect from the set of Dedekind reals. Yeah? Therefore, in the remaining, when I'm in the internal universe, so to the right of that double turn style, I'll write R instead of C. Because from the internal point of view, that's just what it is. Okay, and then I can check that this single morphism, this single function from R to R, from the internal point of view, is continuous. And then I can check that um, we have this inequality if and only if we have all these inequalities, one in inequality for each member of the family. Similarly here, and also we have this statement. Why this setup? You might recall, also from your first day in university, that there's the intermediate value theory. This says that if you have a continuous function, and it's below zero here and above zero there, then somewhere in between there's a zero. It turns out that this uh, theorem, in precisely the formulation I just told you, is not provably intuitionistically, <coughs> and the kripke jahr semantics, the internal language of toposis, provides a beautiful geometric way to appreciate this failure. You see, if the intermediate value theorem would have a poorly intuitionistic proof, then it would apply in the internal language of any topos. Therefore, in particular, it would apply in the sheaf topos. And here I translated for you the conclusion of the intermediate value theorem. It says that locally we can pick zeros of that continuous family in a continuous fashion. And that's not true. If you have a continuous family of continuous functions with uh, satisfying these sign conditions, then yes, each of the functions individually has somewhere a zero, but you can't in general pick these zeros in a continuous manner. And I can show you a counterexample. It's here. So this is a continuous family of continuous functions. I had some term for this function in which a parameter occurred. And this space of which this parameter is drawn from, that's the space x. From the internal point of view, this just looks like a single function. Yeah? It's only our external eyes which think that this is a family of functions. And you see that it's not possible to pick the zero in a continuous fashion. It jumps uh, from, to, from the right to the left or the other way around. Yeah? Yes, yeah. And also, uh, the intermediate value theorem is intuitionistically provable if you further assume that the function is strictly increasing. 
And this automatically yields a theorem about continuous families of continuous functions, namely if you have a continuous family of continuous functions which are all increasing, strictly increasing, then there is a way of locally choosing the zeros in a continuous manner. And if you're not interested in the, in the remainder of the talk, if you're not interested in commutative algebra or algebraic geometry, then I invite you to check that statement for yourself first uh, using the yeah, I already spoiled it, how you can do it using purposefully. We have already done it, we are done. And then check it uh, by hand with epsilon delta. And you will surely uh, manage, but it's, and it's not hard, but it's not entirely trivial either. Yeah, it's, a, it's some exercise in an undergraduate class of analysis. Okay. Now that we have the basics in place, let me tell you how we can give better proofs of these three test, ca test cases than shown in the beginning. For this, we employ a special toppers, a toppers custom made, custom tailored to the ring we are working with, called the little Zariski toppers, or also called the spectrum of the ring. There are several ways of defining it, for instance, as the classifying toppers of local localizations of A, or the classifying locale of prime filters of A, and also in, a, in several more ways. Yeah, a local localization, excellent that you're asking. So a localization of a ring is a ring which looks like this, where you formally inverted some of its elements. And a localization is called local if the resulting ring is a local ring. And when it's a ring local, if and only if, if one is not zero in that ring. And additionally, each time a sum happens to be invertible, then one of its summons already was invertible. This is equivalent, but better than the usual definition that a ring is called local, if and only if it has exactly one maximal ideal. The classical definition only works good in a context where you have the axiom of choice available, which I don't, because at the end of the day, I will always repeat what I did in that day, during that day, in the internal universe of some toppers. And three topuses that is the axiom of choice among a proper class worth of purposes. Very quickly, what's a prime filter? Um, a prime filter is the direct axiomatization of the complement of a prime ideal. Yeah? We need them in constructive mathematics because yeah, um, taking the complement of a prime ideal will not, will not uh, yield a prime filter and vice versa, and the prime filters are slightly better behaved. Also notice that I'm, I played a small trick on you. So if you actually open a classical book on algebraic geometry, you will find the spectrum of a ring defined in exactly that way, but not quite, because they will write that the spectrum consists of all the prime ideals, and the prime filters. Classically, there's no difference because there's an obvious bijection between the prime ideals and prime filters we just pass through the complement, but this definition is, is better. One word regarding the fifth definition here. This definition is only okay if you are either working in a classical meta theory and define the spectrum in any way you wish, or if you're working in a constructive meta theory, but then you have to define the spectrum in a sensible way, for instance, in any of the ways one to four, such that statement number five becomes a tautology. Okay, and let's take a couple of first steps in the little Zariski toppers. So let A be a ring, we consider it's uh, little Zariski toppers. Then because the little Zariski toppers is the classifying locale of prime filters of A, that toppers will contain a very special prime filter of not precisely A, but the constant chief A, yeah? which I write as A underline. Okay, and then what can we do in the internal universe? We can perform in the internal use universe all kinds of constructions. For instance, we can localize. We can formally invert all those elements of the generic prime filter. And this is what's called in algebraic geometry A tilde. Similarly, we can do the same th things for A modules. And I just invite you to take a quick comparison with the classical definition of M tilde, for instance, found in the classical textbook by Hartshorn, yeah, which is like a couple of lines and prime ideals everywhere and so on. 
And most importantly, it's not very conceptual. It's, it's just some definition, yeah? Whereas the top of the theoretic condition actually tells you what the precise relationship between M and M tilde is. M tilde is just a localization of the constant chief M. Let's have a look at some of the properties of the little Lazarus Yes. Yes. Yeah. And um, if I pick one of the more explicit definitions of the little Lazarus topos, for instance, employing the frame of uh, radical ideas, then I can also explicitly write down a definition of F0. It's no problem. OK, here are the basic facts about the little Lazarus topos. Firstly, assuming the Boolean prime ideal theorem in the meta theory, for instance, by assuming the axiom of choice, we completely understand geometric sequence in the little Lazarusky topos. Such a geometric sequence holds in the internal universe of the little Lazarusky topos if and only if it holds at all the stalks of the module. Okay? So this already gives us a quick way to gauge whether a statement might be true or not in the internal universe. Secondly, M tilde inherits any property of M which is stable under localization. More precisely, for which there is an intuitionistic proof that it's stable under localization. Why is that? Well, you can show that M, the module in the topos set, and the constant chief M share exactly the same first order properties. Okay? This is related to the fact that. Um, the uh, little Zerisky uh, topos is an open topos over the topos of sets. This is true in a classical meta theory. It's almost true in a constructive meta theory. There, you, it's open if and only if an, um, null potency in the ring is decidable. But never mind that uh, that subtlety. You can still make that work. So anyway, any property from M transfers to the constant chief M because they have exactly the same properties. And then, you know, M tilde is just a localization of M. Therefore, if the property is stable under localization, it will pass to that also. Okay, so geometric sequence are settled. The magic is because of the non-geometric sequence, statements which cannot be put in that form. Yeah? And there, if you do the calculations, you will notice a number of astounding facts. A tilde is a field. Maybe yes? Yeah, good, perfect. Okay, A tilde is always a field in the sense that non-units are zero. A tilde has not not stable equality, which means that if some element is not not zero, then it's actually zero. So if you have only received classical training, then you might think that this is a triviality, but constructively this is a non-trivial statement saying that an element is not not zero is a slight weakening of saying that it's actually zero. And you know the internal universe of topos is generally uh, intuitionistic. Uh, for instance, the little at risk topos is Boolean if and only if the ring you started with has dimension zero, which is a um, not very interesting case. Therefore, you're quite happy to see a, a statement like this holding in the internal universe because this is some kind of classicality and you're always happy when you can use classical axioms. Yeah? And A tilde is anonymously Noetherian. Recall a ring is called Noetherian if and only if all of its ideals are finally generated. I call a ring anonymously Noetherian if and only if all of its ideals are not not finally generated. A true constructivist will be offended by that notion because you see the point of constructive mathematics is to be informative. But this definition here says given an, uh, an ideal, there is a finite system of generators somewhere out there in the platonic heaven, but it doesn't actually tell you who the generators are. They remain anonymous. But like... Might be some persistent problem, right? Um, we are not philosophically minded, but we just want to have applications. Yeah? And for applications, it turned out that uh, this condition of anonymous 
Neutherinity is actually very useful because it holds in the internal universe of the Zariski toppers. And also it, it is stable under passing to polynomial rings. So Hilbert spaces theorem holds for this kind of condition. I want to add two remarks. Firstly, that field condition wasn't observed by me. It was observed already by the early pioneers in the 1970s. And Tierney writes about it. This field condition is surely important, for its precise significance is somewhat obscure, as, with, as in the case with many such non-geometric formulas. I was very happy when I discovered a proper home, a proper explanation for why this particular non-geometric sequence holds. It's related to, um, to an internal way of expressing that the structure sheaf of a scheme is quasi-coherent. And uh, this statement is just a small shadow of that. And if you're interested in more details about this, then ask me after the talk. Secondly, I'd like to make a small remark regarding the merits of the internal language. You see, as long as you're only considering very simple statements, like there is some element or whatever, the internal language doesn't buy you much. An expert in algebraic geometry will, will have learned just by osmosis how to do the translation by herself without ever having learned topos theory. It's just a standard reduction technique in, in algebraic geometry that you juggle with open sets and pass to smaller open sets and so on. The true power of the internal language um, unfolds when you're considering statements which are of a more complex logical nature. For instance, statements which contain the double negation. And just for your viewing pleasure, I've put here the explicit translation of the statement that this polynomial ring is anonymously in Ethereum from the internal point of view. This unfolds to a one, two, three, four, five, six line condition, even involving not necessarily quasi coherent sheaves. It's quite complicated. We would never think about such a condition. But internally, just, uh, just saying that that polynomial ring is anonymously in Ethereum. So that's where the power of the internal language derives from. It unlocks some parts of mathematical expressions which would otherwise be very hard for us humans to attain. So let's revisit the test cases. Let's redo the first example, the baby application with the subjective matrix. Well, using one of the meta theorems that uh, M tilde is, uh, or A tilde is just the localization of A, we know that being subjective passes to A tilde. A tilde is a field. Therefore, this is a contradiction to basic linear algebra. Therefore, we can deduce bottom falsity in the internal language of the little risky toppers. And if we do the translation of that statement using the Kripke-Schall semantics, we'll obtain that 1 equals 0. So we were able to copy the, the very basic uh, textbook proof yeah, in, in the in the old textbooks which employ classical reasoning, um, not the extremely nice textbook. Um, and because the setup of the internal language is entirely constructive, we could unwind the, the cryptosial semantics and so on and obtain, um, and even obtain a constructive proof which does not use toposes. But we already now know, know now that there's a constructive proof yeah, because and here's a second statement. It's just the same. Um, injectivity is stable under localization. A tilde is a localization of A. Um, therefore, we have an injective matrix of a field. This is a contradiction to day one of university. And let's have a look at uh, Gordon Dick's genetic freeness lemma. So that was the lemma. Yeah? And here's the proof. I'll give you a second to read it, and then we'll discuss it. So the first thing you notice if you have like half an hour of experience working with the Kripke-Joyal semantics is that the statements up there which we are to prove is just the external translation using the Kripke-Joyal semantics of this internal statement. The statement that it's not not the case that one, two, three hold. Yeah? 
Um, if you're not an expert on the internal language, this might look slightly mysterious to you, um, but I can promise to you really I know of that statement. Thank you very much. And um, um, the double neg negation translation um, translates into some weirdness of the obtained external proof, um, which is, by the way, exactly the same weirdness as continuations in computer science. They are a little bit hard to think about, and that's exactly the same issue. I can, could make this formal if you want to. Um, the external proof obtained this way yeah, has the goal of verifying that 1 equals 0, but it doesn't immediately pursue that, that goal. Instead, it first starts to show that m is free, that b is free, that a to b is a finite presentation, that m is finally presented as a model of a b. And when it has finished doing so, it um, uses the assumption in the special case f equals 1. So it's kind of weird twisted proof. Okay, but from the internal point of view, it's, it's really simple. You observe the correspondence between this internal statement and the external statement. When you've worked with internal language, you'll notice this immediately. It's always the same if you have a statement like, if blah, blah, blah is the only element such that, then 1 equals 0. This will always translate to a not-not. Okay, and then you just have to verify this internal statement, and that's totally easy because A tilde is a field you are in the situation of linear algebra over a field. Yeah? Um, and for instance, you learned in your first day of university, it was a long day, that um, given a vector space, B tilde and M tilde are vector spaces because they are models of a field. Given a vector space, uh, it has, uh, if it's finally generated, it has, it has a basis. And if you're a little bit more careful, you see that this statement as quoted does not hold true intuitionistically, but a very slight variant with just the same level of complexity of proof holds true, namely, given a finite generated vector space, it's not not the case that it has a basis. It's not not free. Yes? So, uh, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, um, have, a, have a look. Yeah, the thing is, how do you prove it? You start with a generating family, and then you say, well, either it's already linear independent, then we are done, or not, in which case one of the vectors is a linear combination of the others, and then we can continue by induction. You can't do that, but, um, um, so phi or not phi is not intuitionistically acceptable, but the following version of it is acceptable, not not phi or not phi. And this is what makes the proof work. Okay. So now that we are bootstrapped and now know a general technique for, um, for obtaining proofs in algebra, which are constructive and which can be quite short and actually improve on, um, on the classical situation, I'd like to turn to algebraic geometry for a little bit for the remaining 20 minutes of the talk. Just let me make one more remark, namely this technique of using the internal language of topos and commutative algebra is very strongly related to the grant research program called Dynamical Methods in Algebra, pioneered by many people such as Cocon, Coste, Roy, Lombardi, Kitté, and many, many others. Um, um, uh, just a quick comment on the relationship. So I like to work in topos because then I have a whole universe at my disposal. I don't have to restrict my reasoning or my constructions to a specific small fragment of logic. In dynamical methods of algebra, you most of the time, like work, for instance, work in, in a geometric logic, which is a little bit more restrictive. I think Steve Vickers will d disagree. We'll have his talk later on. I'm looking forward to that. 
Um, ah, okay, you mostly agree on it. Um, secondly, I, I'm a very narrow-minded person. All my life I've worked in the little, the risky toppers of a the scheme. They, all the time, uh, employ new geometric theories just for their applications at hand. Um, yeah, and maybe a final remark. Um, it's very useful to have many different viewpoints on a subject. Topper theory provides one, use, one point of view on dynamical methods, and the two dynamical methods provide a different one. They have very interesting intuitions about dynamic proofs which unfold in cases, and you should have a look at their presentations. Good. Algebraic geometry. It turns out that we can use exactly the same machinery, not only for cumulative algebra, but also for uh, algebraic geometry. You know that many notions in algebraic geometry are inspired by corresponding notions in commutative algebra. And uh, Topos theory provides a one way of making this precise. So my goal is to precisely, rigorously understand notions and statements of algebraic geometry as notions and statements of algebra internal to, uh, to relevant toposes. This is a program I started a couple of years ago. And while there's still much to do in order to be useful for, to adva for advanced algebraic geometry, I'm already quite pleased with the dictionary entries I've obtained so far. This is just a short excerpt. Let me just say one, state one example and then I want to continue because I still want to show with you with this embarrassing slide. Okay? Um, you have two statements at the bottom. The left one is a sheaf theoretic statement. The right one is a very basic statement about modules which you've learned on your first day in university. And you don't need to be an expert in topos theory to recognize that there is some relationship between those two statements. But unless you have the internal language of topos available, you cannot precisely pinpoint the relationship. And even though you will ought to know from the beginning how you will probably prove the left uh, the right hand statement, namely somewhere employing that statement, you still have to perform the proof manually. And in that process you have to juggle open sets. You are given some sections on sets, then you have to pass to smaller open subsets and so on. I'm not claiming that's a difficult theorem. No, no worries about that. It's a simple theorem, you can do it. But I argue that, uh, that the five minutes spent doing that are better spent doing other things. And also maybe more to the point, I really f felt liberated when, when I saw each time I see a connection, a formal connection between algebraic geometry and commutative algebra. Because then I just know that, that I don't have to prove the theorem on the left. It's already proven to me by the way I will explain in a second. Yeah, it's, it gives a much more conceptual way of understanding algebraic geometry. Okay, here's how it goes. Let's, uh, let's have a, uh, consider a short exact sequence of sheaves of modules. Each of these sheets of modules will look like, from the internal point of view, just like an ordinary module. And because these sheets of modules are of finite type, and because we have this dictionary, we can cl and conclude that their internal counterparts are finitely generated modules. So internally, we have a short exit sequence of modules. The two outer ones are finitely generated. Therefore, by the theorem on the right, we can conclude that the middle one is finitely gen generated as well. And then, using again the dictionary, this time from right to left, we conclude that the sheaf in the middle is a finite type. Yeah. So this is how you do it. This was just a basic example. There are much more advanced examples, but I'd like now to pass to further topics. Um, especially interesting to some of you might be these three entries, and if you want to discuss them, then just ask, ask a question either now or later, as you wish. Okay, so the approach I showed you on the previous slide, I hope that it's actually useful to working algebraic geometers. Yeah? The approach I now want to show you is part of a, of, of a more long-term vision. You see, when I was little, um, somebody gave me a pointer to synthetic differential geometry. I think it was Andre Bauer on his very great blog on constructive mathematics. And it was immediately hooked. Because synthetic differential geometry provides a way of doing differential geometry in a way which 
does away with all the usual coding uh, as, as set theoretic constructors. There are lots of um, ideas in di differential geometry which cannot be formalized in mainstream differential geometry, but which can be perfectly formalized in synthetic differential geometry. For instance, the notion of an infinitesimal piece of curve, a tangent vector, yeah? this can be immediately formalized in synthetic differential geometry. And in fact, the main automation by, for instance, Anders Koch, who developed, among many others, for instance, Eduardo Dubuc, who's sitting there, uh, synthetic differential geometry, um, was that they would be able to literally interpret the original works by Sophos Lee, who still like worked in a pre-rigorous state and just did mathematics. Yeah? And it turns out all of his writings or many of his writings can be made rigorous just by inter interpreting them in the internal language of well-adopted models to synthetic uh, to differential geometry. So, and I wanted to have the same for algebraic geometry. Therefore, I turned to my favorite wiki to look how it goes and noticed that it wasn't yet developed. Therefore, I did it, at least very, very small parts of it, and here you see how it goes. Instead of employing the usual approach using locally ringed spaces, or the more philosophically rewarding and economical approach of a Grotendieck's functor of points account, we model schemes directly as sets in the internal universe of a specific topos, namely the big, the risky topos of a scheme. Here's how, so using this approach, a scheme, which is usually a complicated object, will turn into a plain set and a morphism of schemes will turn into a map between these sets. Yeah. Here are some details on that. Sure. So risky topos? Yeah. Yeah, yes. And I do know. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the comment was that in order to find the big risky topos of scheme, I already have to know what the scheme is. And my answer is, yes, I do know. So the usual definition doesn't work, of course. Yeah, it doesn't work in a constructive met uh, context. I cannot define a scheme to be a locally ringed space, locally isomorphic to the spectrum. But uh, Gordon Dick's um, fact of points approach works just fine. And also it works just fine if we define a scheme to be a locally ringed locale which is locally isomorphic to the spectrum of a ring. You can also define it as a locally ring topos, which is locally isomorphic to the spectrum, or you could imply the techniques of formal geometry. So at least three approaches to constructive algebra algebraic geometry. So that, that does, uh, so that does work. It can be defined as the topos of sheaves for the Zariski topos uh, topology over the slice category of affine schemes over S, be careful, you have to impose some conditions like locally or final presentations if you want it to be actually working, yeah? if you don't want to ignore size issues. And there are a couple different ways also of defining it. Um, I quite like the third one um, because I quite like to, yeah, I watched the movie Inception and since then I like to go deeper and this is exactly what the statement three says. It says, first switch from your home universe into the internal universe of the little Zariski topos, sheaves on S, and then internally to that topos, construct a new classifying topos. So we, we've done topos theory internal to a topos. Okay, and if we are given an S scheme X, we have its functor of points, and from the internal point of view, this will feel like the true set of points of that scheme. I'm not saying set theoretical points, which have some generic points in it and weird stuff, but like the honest geometric points. Okay, and uh, then you can do all kinds of synthetic constructions in the internal language. For instance, you can define affine space as you would expect, as you would do if you were a classical Italian algebraic geometer. You can define the projective space in a very naive fashion, just set of homogeneous coordinates. You can define the hair twisting sheaves on it in a very simple language. A sheaf on a synthetic scheme is just a family of modules, one module for each point of the scheme. 
You can define the spectrum, you can define the tangent bundle, you can define when a subset is called quasi-compact and open, also just open. You can do all sorts of things. It's been developed up to and including the point of etal geometric morphisms. What's still missing is an account of derived categories, intersection theory, and so on. Yeah, but up to and including etal geometric morphisms, you have a synthetic account for algebraic geometry at your disposal. Okay, um, in a couple of seconds we have this embarrassing slide. I just want to show you some parts of the remaining slides before that. So some of you will enjoy a discussion of the relationship between the big Zoroastrian topos of a scheme and the small Zoroastrian topos, which is just the topos of sheaves on the, on the scheme itself. Um, we have the following three statements. So firstly, the small Zariski topos can be reconstructed from the big one by cutting out the largest subtopos where this particular map is bijected from the internal point of view. And this is taking an intersection of subtoposes, but the intersection is not indexed by some external set, but true to the spirit of Borsot's last, last talk, it's indexed by, inter by an internal set, by an object of the Zariski topos namely a want to impose by objectivity. This says for any element of that, there's precisely one here. So I'm indexing over the internal elements of that one. Also there's a way of reconstructing the big risk topos from this small one, namely this was already on the previous slide. It can be reconstructed as the classifying topos of local OS algebras, which are local over OS. There's an interesting fine point here because you might think that we can do without this addition here. You might think, well, from the internal point of view of the little Zariski topos, OS is just an ordinary ring and we can just take its ordinary Zariski topos. That's correct, but this construction will then yield from the external point of view not the correct big Zariski topos, but some pseudo version of it. And these constructions will coincide or if and only if the dimension of the scheme S is zero. So again, a pathological case. And also, the big Zariski topos can be obtained as a lax pullback. Um, Peter Arndt, Matthias Hutzler, and I had much fun when we discussed this. And, we, and th So this last point is joint work with us three. And um, if you're interested, then ask me a question. <coughs> okay. If you want to work internally to the big Zariski topos, it's useful to know several properties of the affine line of A1. For instance, it's a field in any of these senses. Um, or you have the interesting statement that any map from A1 to A1 is a polynomial. Okay, and now the embarrassing starts. Yeah? Just one warm up and then the embarrassing slide. Um, it turns out that all known ring theoretical special properties of the affine line in the big series topos are a consequence of one very specific non geometric sequence. Namely, the statement that the ring A1 is synthetically quasi-coherent. This is a very strong form of the cock lovier axiom. It says that the map up there you are seeing is a bijective map. Um, this, this statement has a very nice geometric interpretation because the ring R, yeah, you know from algebraic geometry that you can view a ring always as the set of functions on, on the spectrum of the ring. And this is exactly what's written there. On the right hand side we have the ring R, on the left hand side we have the internal home, just in the internal set of maps, from the spectrum of R to the number line, functions on spec R. And the map maps any formal function, formal element of R to an honest set theoretical function. And the statement is that this is a bijection. This is totally uh, so this is only satisfies for the zero ring if you switch on classical logic. But internal to the big Zariski topos, where intuitionistic logic reigns, you have this. Yeah, and it's exactly what you would expect from a proper synthetic account. There shouldn't be any functions other than the synthetically constructed ones. Okay. And I know, I'm now wondering yeah, if, if any known property of A1 follows from this one, from this synthetic quasi currents, whether there is more to it. So I'd like to study whether I can show that maybe even every non-geometric sequence follows from this one. 
Um, and I want to generalize this to, um, to more general topos. I don't think that this is very specific to the big risk topos. And I'm very excited to see how it will turn out. Uh, a reason to believe that this can be vastly generalized is because there is one thing which certainly knows about all the non-geometric sequence appearing in a topos, namely the site, because the site determines the topos. And this is, in a certain sense, a way of encoding the site into the topos. That is why I believe that. The reason why I'm so much interested in those non-geometric sequences is because they are so powerful in applications. Therefore, I'd like to obtain more of them. But as you know, there's no way of obtaining them. You just have to stumble on them by luck when you create such a dictionary. Yes? Yeah, uh, internal, internal. So this is an internal statement. It says internally for any finally represented A1 algebra, that map is bijective. Is that a um, excellent question. It's uh, Kuratowski finiteness. Yeah? It means that um, uh, yeah, I can write down a list of generators in which uh, there might be duplicates and that I can write down a list of generators for of the relations in which, again, there might be duplicates. Okay, the final slide, the embarrassing slide. You see, topuses were invented by Grotendieck long time ago. Any Grotendieck topos is the classifying topos of some geometric theory. Therefore, you might think that we have vast knowledge on which theories are classified by all the topuses which are in active use in algebraic geometry, which are approximately 15. Yeah? The big Zariski topos is just the beginning, and then there are more refined variants. The true state of the art is very, very embarrassing. So we know what the Zariski topos classifies. It's essentially due to Monique Hakim, only that she doesn't, didn't employ logical notation, but still all, all the important things are in there. We know what the big Ital topos classifies. And then for a long time, that was a complete list of where we knew what it would classify. We know for many of the active toposes in use, we even know for many of those toposes what the points are. But we don't know the theories. Therefore, I was very happy when I managed to compute the um, theories of the FPF topos and the subjective topos. But even for the FPF topos, still a huge mystery remains because, um, so while we know now know that it classifies FPF local rings, whatever they are, there's also a conjecture by Gavin Wraith in his classic paper, I invite you to read it, Generic Gallo Theory of Local Rings, that it actually should classify algebraically closed, um, algebraically closed rings, local rings. And we don't know yet whether his conjecture is also true. This could perfectly be the case. Yeah? Then there's a pH, top, the pH topos, useful for Wojewodzki homotopy theory. Um, we just have a conjecture of um, what it might classify. We have the double negation topos, um, for which there's also just a conjecture. Um, it's related to um, joint work by Olivia and her former, former PhD supervisor on um, demorganization of the theory of um, fields, but still they are conjectures. And the only thing which is like very good is a recent breakthrough by Matthias Hutzler. Can, uh, yeah, that's Matthias Hussler. He has a project of studying the infinitesimal and the crystalline topos. And for the infinitesimal topos he succeeded, he found out that it classifies local algebras together with a nilpotent idea. I hope that in, in a couple of years, we'll, this slide will not be that embarrassing. I hope that we'll have a complete list on the left-hand side, all the active toposes in use of algebraic geometry on the right-hand side the classifying theories. Thank you very much for your attention.